Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jesse Barker, and I'm a software engineer here at ARM uh, in the graphics software organization, so partially looking after, after Vulkan uh, and partially uh, looking after uh, prototyping and investigations and some of our uh, future GPU and API features. And I've been doing that kind of thing, I guess, for, gosh, I, should, I shouldn't say my outside voice, but the better part of 25 years. Uh, on various 2D and, and 3D graphics uh, subsystems. And I have to say that uh, in, in, in all that time, uh, one of the coolest things that I've had the opportunity to do and spend time with that really cool group of people that Tom showed the picture of earlier is, is uh, working on Vulcan for, for the past couple of years. Uh, it's been just a real joy and, uh, and it's, been, it's been pretty awesome. Uh, so our talk here today, uh, or at least mine, is really about, uh, uh, I think one, one of the previous presenters, Hans Christian, maybe referred to it as, as sh uh, either shape or as uh, sort of the, the signature. Really, uh, as Tom said in his talk, it's really about the contract uh, between the Vulcan API and uh, Spearby and being able to, uh, being able to uh, provide all of the right data uh, both in and out of the shaders when when they expect it. So resources from sort of a very high level are, are really just these, these, these input and output data uh, from a shader. And most of them, in our case, are in memory. Uh, some of them have sort of special little side paths. Um, we'll talk about those very briefly here. I think they've, they've been covered uh, in, in some of the other talks uh, pretty extensively. Um, and in, in Vulkan, these these, these shader inputs and outputs are, are referenced uh, via something that we call descriptors. And I'll, I'll go into that shortly. Uh, most of them are sort of, I think of as pretty general purpose, but some of them are really quite specialized. Uh, you have things like um, render targets, which are, you know, they're really just images, but, um, but they're kind of special, at least for most people's GPU hardware, they're kind of special. So we call them out and handle them a little bit differently. And the same thing with the way that we feed uh, the actual uh, vertex input, um, where again, there's, uh, there's sufficient specialized hardware in a number of GPUs to make it worthwhile us handling this a little bit differently. So some of these that we're talking about, so buffers, these are very much like, like the same buffers that you had in OpenGL. They're, they're just you know, arrays of data. Um, images. Uh, Again, they're, they're just you know, things like textures. Uh, they, both of these, uh, by the way, on Vulkan can be read and or write, depending on how you create them, how you set them up, and what you tell Vulkan you're going to do with them. Uh, we have samplers, which are basically uh, parameter sets for uh, looking up data into images and you know, filtering them, uh, computing the coordinates that you're going to use to, to address, address the image. And uh, a few other you know, bits of metadata around you know, things like nit mapping and that sort of thing. And there's one other thing that I, I'm going to call out explicitly here, and, and those are input attachments. And, and Andrew's going to tell you a lot more about why you care about those in his talk. But I, I call them out here. They're really just a special kind of uh, unfiltered image. So you're dealing with sort of an image that contains, for lack of a better way to put it, raw data. And uh, that has. That does have exposure in OpenGL. If you if you uh, have used Molly platforms, certainly in OpenGL ES, and I believe, guys, don't hit me if I'm wrong about this. Imagination supports this also, pixel local storage and frame buffer fetch and those sorts of things. Um, so those were those were extensions to support this kind of functionality. But they, you know, in Vulkan, we've really brought them to the forefront and made it really a formalized part of the API. And of course, that has uh, you know sort of full cooperation on, on the Sphere B side as well, and and I think I think Neil actually mentioned some of that a little bit earlier. So those are those are really what we're talking about when we talk about resources. Um, descriptors. Well, uh, let's see. So quickly, uh, you know, as, as Tom mentioned, right, you have a resource like an image, and uh, you you created the image, you've asked it what its memory requirements are, and you uh, allocated some device memory and you've bound it to the image. Um, images in Vulkan can't be sampled from directly. They can't be uh, looked up and filtered directly. Uh, we need what we call an image view, which is really just um, 
it's really just a continuous, a continuous view of a sub-resource of an image is, is what we call it in Vulkan. Really, you decide some section of the image that you're really interested in, and you kind of create a little window into that. And there are some additional things that you can tweak over and above the base image, so you can actually change the format a little bit when, uh, when you create the view out of the image that's a little bit different from the format, the base format of the image that you originally created. And so you want to use this in, in your pipeline. And so you know it, the API requires something that we call a descriptor, which is, is really it's just a handle to it's just a handle to the to the object, and uh, and some type and some other metadata information that allows the API to make a connection between the actual application resource and making it available to the shader. So uh, as as has been mentioned several times, I, I I take it Michael is right, and the things that we're repeating a lot are actually kind of important. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wasting a little bit of air here, but. No, I, I, think, I think this is really kind of important. Um, so descriptor sets really are just a way of organizing, uh, organizing um, resources into sort of uh, usable blocks, right? If you want to think of it that way, kind of uh, building blocks like Legos or something like that. In OpenGL, you know, you're, you're probably accustomed to having uh, sort of two ways of doing this on a very fine grain basis, right? You, you can either ask the compiler to generate all of your binding locations for you, and then you can ask the API what those are. Um, and, but we don't generally like reflection very much in Vulkan, so we didn't do that. Uh, or you can explicitly create your own binding locations, and you can tell the API what binding locations you want to, you want to use, and then everything else that you do is based on that. But again, it's on a very fine-grained basis. And if you've got, I don't know, uh, let's say it's 100 resources or something like that, they're going to be used with a pipeline, that's kind of uh, cumbersome and uh, yeah, it's just kind of cumbersome. So in Vulkan, we've we've allowed uh, we've allowed the application uh, developer to organize these into into sets, and the the sets are are sort of the, the the nice big package that you can pass handles to and all that kind of stuff. But really, the magic behind descriptor sets, in a sense, is is the layout, and the layout is sort of the thing you see described in this table, and I've abbreviated the heck out of it. Um, there's a lot more information in in the layout than this, but uh, you determine which binding location you want to use, uh, what type of resource it is that you're going to reference, and what stages of the pipeline are going to consume this resource. So you can actually, as an application developer, you can tell the pipeline, hey, I'm only going to touch this from my vertex stage, but you don't need to make this available to my fragment stage, and that's OK. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a hint in that it, the, the driver can actually sort of ignore that and just make it available everywhere as long as they're not going to overly constrain uh, the resource mapping for you and make it so that something downstream doesn't work for you. But basically, it's a good way to tell the implementation, this, this is exactly what I'm doing and how I plan to use all these resources, so please make this as optimal as possible. So the layout, as I say, uh, is sort of like a template from which you can stamp out any number of descriptor sets that look just like that. Um, which is which is pretty handy if you have um, if you really want to keep things simple. For example, uh, you can have basically a very similar or the same in some cases uh, overall pipeline layout for, uh, for for your for your application and just substitute in new resources and, and new other things as you go along uh, with all these different pipelines. And you can kind of use the same stuff. Um, and in fact, there's you know there's sort of Compatibility descriptions within the API that say that well, if I haven't if I haven't done anything uh, if I haven't changed pipelines to something that's incompatible with the last one, my descriptor set bindings live on. So that's also kind of cool. Um, as uh, as with command buffers, uh, as Michael was talking about, um, we we uh, we have a sort of a parent object of a descriptor set, which is the descriptor pool, and it's there to allow the threading model to work. So you have uh, incredibly lightweight threading based on this pool model. You basically um, use these data structures. Um, Vulkan is very verbose, as I, I think Tom mentioned, and uh, uh, this, this is a small example of that. But anyway, you, you tell, you tell the, uh, the driver, I want you to create a descriptor pool, and I want it to have uh, some number of some type of descriptors. I want four samplers, and I want 100 images, and I want you know, so on. And those get placed in, in uh, those get placed in these arrays, and you can tell it again. There are some flags 
Uh, Michael referred to the resetting behavior, and the descriptor pools have similar reset logic. You can you can reset individually or or, or globally, um, and uh, not globally, but <laughs> the whole pool. Sorry. Um, and then you can also indicate how many sets, how many descriptor sets you actually expect to be able to create out of this pool. Um, and you know, it's just potentially some kind of useful information based on uh, how the, the driver might internally be allocating this memory. This is one of the, the sort of only couple of places where Vulkan is actually on the hook for managing a certain amount of its device memory is for, is for the memory that backs, backs these resources. So then you have this, this pool of some number of each type of descriptors, and so they are tracked separately, and you specify them that way. Um, but then, again, as with the case with command pools, you have one of these per thread, and that's sort of how you go about managing all of your resource sets uh, in, in, in sort of a threaded fashion. You can, work on your, you can work on descriptor sets from different pools across different threads, and everything stays sane, and you don't have to take expensive locks in order to do that. So um, now we're at the point where we have our descriptor pool and we have our layouts and now we can allocate some descriptor sets and that's actually the easy part, right? Uh, you take your layout objects um, and uh, pass those into uh, the allocate function in the descriptor pool and the descriptor pool happily returns back some number of descriptor sets based on the number of layouts that you passed in. Now you have this bunch of descriptor sets and uh, well, you still need to know what to do with them. So the pipeline layout is sort of a layout of layouts. It's, it's the overall signature. It's the thing that ties everything together. And uh, this is, as I say, this, this is sort of uh, the real instance of that contract between the API and, and the pipeline shaders that I talked about earlier. And here's a slightly more complicated version of the diagram that we sort of saw on the original descriptor set slide. And uh, unfortunately, I chose really bad colors. but you can see that with the layout qualifiers, you, you see that um, you know. So that, that first uniform, uh, that first uniform buffer you have is in descriptor set zero, and it's binding number zero, and obviously it's it's a uniform buffer, and we expect to use that in all uh, all graphic stages, all graphics operations, and so on. I've, I've intentionally chosen a, a very simple layout. Uh, you can do whatever you want to make this as, as complicated as you want, but be forewarned that um, you should, you should uh, test this against uh, anything you care to run on because your mileage may vary in terms of how well uh, many descriptor sets or descriptor sets with large gaps or things like that. So if you're gonna pop, uh, sort of sparsely populate your, uh, your descriptor sets, there, there may be penalties for that on some hardware and not others, and, you really want to kind of evaluate that for yourself to see how, how this goes. But having, having this pipeline layout means that you can, you, can, uh, you can set all this up at once and you know, uh, you know what all your bindings, your bindings look like ahead of time and you don't have to do it you know, one, uh, one little attribute or one little uniform individually at a time. You can do <coughs> this stuff and mass by um, by, uh, yeah, by, by binding descriptor sets to the command line. So we have descriptor sets. We know what the overall layout is supposed to be. Um, but we actually don't have resources in the descriptor sets. The, the descriptor sets are basically empty. They're just slots for them, but they're, they're really <coughs> empty. So Vulcan provides us with this, with this uh, facility uh, called update descriptor sets. And really, that's the way that you fill these things in. And there's sort of two ways that you can populate a descriptor set. Uh, the first way is uh, just, by, just by writing it directly. So this top data structure, uh, you don't have to look at the whole thing, it's okay, I'm just there for illustration. <coughs> the first way is basically you, you pass an array of information about the resources themselves, uh, image views, buffers, buffer views, um, and, and samplers and so on, and you give it a base, uh, a base offset into the descriptor set where you want to start writing those descriptors and how many you've got. And the, the driver goes through and takes that information and fills out that section of your descriptor set. Uh, similarly, if you have, let's say you have other descriptor sets, you're gonna have, I, I mentioned the idea that you might use a very similar pipeline layout for a number of different pipelines. One thing you might want to do is uh, copy them. 
So you can say, well, I've got this descriptor set that kind of mostly has all this stuff that I want to use somewhere else. And you can tell it, OK, by the way, so here's, here's descriptor set A. And I want you to take slots you know, 3 through 26 in that descriptor set and copy them to this new descriptor set that I'm giving you. Uh, and, it, and the driver will do that. A couple of really important things to note about update descriptor sets. Um, and this, uh, this ties back into what, what Michael was talking about with command buffer reuse, uh, reuse, which is that you're not allowed to do this while descriptor sets are actually being referenced or used. Uh, I forget how we actually say it in the spec. Uh, we've gone back and forth on the language a couple of times. But the point is that if you've, decide to, if you've decided to re-execute a secondary command buffer and you have a descriptor set bound into it, uh, you can't touch it. Um, so that is, again, up to the application to manage that, that synchronization to make sure that you don't have uh, any, any, any uses of that descriptor set in flight when you go to actually update it. Uh, and this is maybe one of the reasons why you, you would possibly want to sort of uh, multi-buffer and multi-thread this, sort of, this sort of operation. Um, the, other, the other side of that is that um, to, I think to, to satisfy the use case that Michael was talking about, and I think he was very careful to talk about updating the UBO rather than updating the descriptor set that references the UBO. So you have a, a little extra level of indirection. So what you can, for example, map the memory that backs your uniform buffer object and scribble in new data there and um, flush that out and then boom you're ready to go with the new uh, with, with, with the new draw calls of the, of the same command buffer with slightly different uniforms so that's that's how I just wanted to illustrate that that's how that would be done because uh, this can make it look oh wow that's really easy it's not that it's hard but you have to be careful about how to do it or you will get yourself into some really weird uh, corner cases and some uh, undefined behavior I, I guess we like to call it in Vulcan Ah, finally, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm ready to actually do something here. So I, I've, I've bound a pipeline. Let's let's say that I've bound a pipeline. We don't can, we don't care too much about order of operations here, but as I said a minute ago, uh, if you have uh, if if you have pipelines which are compatible, you can you know sort of bind them at will, and your descriptor set bindings don't change. You're fine. But if, if the pipelines aren't quite compatible, then you can sort of invalidate your descriptor set bindings and, and maybe not be super aware of it. So let's say we've bound our pipeline already. Um, so we're going to, uh, again, you, you, you need to, at some point, you need to have passed enough uh, descriptor sets to the correct binding locations to satisfy the pipeline layout. So uh, Vulkan requires support for a minimum of four bound descriptor sets at any given time. So you can have you know, descriptor sets uh, 0 through 3. The, the conceptual idea is that you're binding with frequency. So descriptor set 0 is meant to be changed least often, and descriptor set 3 is intended to be changed most often. That doesn't mean you have to do it that way. Feel free just to have descriptor set 0. Everything will still just work. But like I said, if you're kind of mixing and matching and using sort of sections of your pipeline layout and overlapping some of them but not all of them, or your algorithm determines that you need to have some things that change, you know, per object or, or something like that, then, then that's how you would that's how you sort of accomplish that. Um, and then you also need to tell it what, what kind of uh, which which pipeline uh, uh, to use because any uh, any command buffer has support for a graphics and a compute pipeline at the same time as long as as Michael said you're outside of a render pass. Um, so you tell it, do I want to use this for graphics and for, or for compute? Because you can make the descriptor sets compatible for both. So it's possible that you can switch to a compute pipeline that doesn't invalidate a descriptor set. And now you're ready to draw. Oh, uh, I did, I did uh, promise to mention uh, the one thing that was in the pipeline layout that I, I didn't sort of talk about here, which is push constants. Um, I didn't really talk about them because they're not formal resources in this way. They're kind of a, a sort of a, a fast path that's not really sort of a memory-backed uh, object. Um, but those are part of your pipeline layout. And if you define them as part of your pipeline layout, there's another uh, command buffer command called uh, BK command push constants, where you define what the actual push constant data is for that, uh, for that pipeline for w while you're using that. And you can update the push constants between draws and stuff like that as well. So um, I did mention. Um, 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about render targets because those are special in a whole different way, um, and I think Andrew's going to talk about them uh, at least a little bit with respect to render passes. But I did promise to talk about uh, vertex input and, and why that's different. And the short answer is that it's a lot of hardware has fixed function blocks for handling vertex batch and vertex input. So um, we made it so that uh, providing that information uh, to Vulkan was done in sort of more of a fixed function way. And uh, but the, the the driver is free if the driver actually ha happens to handle this stuff in the shader. Um, the the driver is is free to basically take the input descriptions I'm going to show you now and turn them into descriptors effectively. But uh, this is what it looks like in the API. So again, uh, very simple sort of GLSL stuff. Um, you have uh, you know a, a, a three element uh, position uh, attribute and a two element texture coordinate attribute. So in your in your application code, you might define two structures that sort of look like that, and uh, you know, fill out a bunch of post memory and upload them to the you know to the GPU and all that kind of good stuff. Um, in Vulkan, uh, it it sort of looks a bit a bit more like this. Um, so you have uh, binding descriptions, which are basically how many how many buffers am I going to bind to the command buffer before I can draw with that pipeline. And then the attribute, you know, the, the attribute description, which is basically what do the attributes within those buffers look like. And so the structures basically allow you to say, well, I've got one buffer that has you know, an array of vec3s in it, and I've got another buffer that has an array of, uh, what would they be, uvec2s, I think, in, in, G, in, uh, in GLSL. And uh, you, pass that, uh, you pass this information into the, into the pipeline at creation time, and then the pipeline prepared, it, it, the, when you create the pipeline, it's prepared for uh, two vertex buffer bindings, and it expects to find those, uh, those attributes as they're described there. Uh, one, one other cool thing that, that we did, which I think, is, I think is actually pretty similar to the way GL does it, which is, um, I've made this a VEC3 just for the purposes of illustration, but in reality, your shader can have a VEC4 for position, and you can still pass three elements in at the API level, or your vertex buffer can have three elements, and you'll get the same, the same old same fourth element, uh, you know, sort of predefined value of uh, one. So, or even if it's a VEC2 uh, that you've passed into the API, and your your shader declares a VEC4, you'll get x, y, zero, and one. So it, it it happily sort of promotes your vector in a same fashion. So for attribute handling, that's that's actually kind of a cool thing. Uh, and then on top of this, of course, you, you can bind an index buffer and, and do draw index, or you can leave it like this and do, uh, do just a regular draw command. And I think that's it. So, uh, questions? Either I made no sense, or everybody really understands this really well. Either way, I'm okay with it. Oh, oh we are. Quick one then, uh, push constants. Uh, yes, push constants. Uh, push constant. Uh, am I sort of right in thinking it's essentially a literal in the command buffer? Is it a literal in the command buffer? Um, I expect so. Thanks. I, I mean, I, sorry, I, I, I don't, I don't know how everybody's doing that, so it's it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to answer that question. Does um, Oh, the question is, uh, are, do push constants, when you do a command push constants, does that literally put literals into the command buffer? Or, you know, is there, is there some other sort of uh, magic going on? I don't think Vulcan says or cares, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's... And the coding of them has to go in because it has to happen when you right. execute the command buffer. Yeah, so, I mean, they... Uh, You can, I mean, I can, I can see a, a different ways to, to handle this. I don't want to say too much about you know, any particular piece of hardware. Um, but yeah, there, there, there could be a bunch of different ways to do it. I mean, you could turn them into, I suppose you could turn them into register loads or something like that. I mean, it, it just, it, it really depends on, that's very implementation dependent. I think most things you say generally find it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, um, I think, you know, the injecting the literals in the command buffer, I, I think it, it's, safe way to think about it, but I think it, it does come down to being implementation specific. I mean, I, I believe that, that is, we did something like that on NVIDIA hardware. 
Um, I don't know the specifics of it, but um, I, I think it, it's generally it, it is uh, a, it, it you know, basically hitches a ride you know, with the commands in the command button. Uh, hence, it's on the fast path. Um, but I, 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 I think, as Jesse says, being specific about it is probably not something we should do. Anyone else? Okay, uh, so in that case, uh, I, I'd like to bring up uh, Andrew Garrett, who's going to tell us uh, all about uh, the render pass in Vulcan. Or at least, uh, I hope so. Sorry.